We are grateful and thankful for your many, many, many blessings. Thank you for the freedoms that we have been given. Certainly the freedoms that you have given us in this country in which we live. May we never forget where that freedom comes from. There is not a government that gives us that freedom. You give us that freedom. We have forefathers that connected themselves to you. Regardless of what history books may try and teach, the founders of this nation were godly men who patterned much of what we study today and much of what we celebrate today. And the Constitution that we've been given is based on many of the principles and scriptures of your word. And God, I pray that we would always honor that. We would always remember that. And God, we would always protect that. Lord, I pray that uh, you would work. You would work. The enemy is certainly at work among our leadership and among the nation today, all across our country, creating division. Uh, Lord, and the scriptures teach us very clearly. You, Jesus, spoke uh, very, very plainly when you said, a nation divided against itself will not stand. A house divided against itself will not stand. And Lord, so it is. And so, Lord, I'm praying that you'll bring unity to our nation. I pray that you'll bring unity to our homes. And that, God, you'd begin to build, again, a foundation and a strong, strong home base here in our country. Lord, I pray that we would begin to see moms and dads praying with kids again. And mom and dads and kids worshiping together and worshiping you. And, God, I pray that that would be the priority of our lives. Lord, we thank you again for the freedoms, but may we never take them for granted. As we study your word today, and we see so many things that were written down long ago that began to be fulfilled in your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. And God, I pray that we would begin to take this scripture, study it, hear it, and then live it. That's essential. And God, I pray that we'd never, ever forget that. It's not just what we hear, it's what we practice. And God, we will practice what we worship. That's just a fact. We can't help it. What's in our heart comes out in the daily life that we live. And Lord, as we look at our own life, as we study ourselves in the mirror every day, and we sit down before your word, and your word reflects back who we are, the picture we see... The heart that speaks, it speaks loudly. We see it, the people around us see it, our children experience it, and God, I just pray that what they experience is the love of Jesus Christ pouring forth from us to a lost and dying world. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of being able to study, the privilege of being able to teach, the privilege of being able to work with other people. And God, I pray that each of us will take our responsibility to do that and we'll do it with, with just the greatest zeal and passion that we can possibly do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you again for loving us in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Now, last week, the last few weeks in Mark chapter 8, uh, we wrapped up, though, last week in Mark 8. We started reading in verse 33 and went down through verse 38. It's in those verses that Jesus talked about the fact that if we're going to be able to be the Christians that He has called us to be, as He builds this church, we have to learn to savor the things of God and not the things of man. We have to learn to study, study, and pray. The scripture is something that has to be in our thought process at all times. And when we began to focus on the Word of God and we began to study the scriptures and when we continue in our prayer life, the thing that will begin to happen is we will begin to develop this boldness. 
and this passion for Christ. And we become so bold that no matter where Jesus Christ lives, we know and we are committed to follow Him everywhere He goes. And so if He leads us into a battlefield, we're willing to go to that. If He leads us to share Jesus with somebody, we are willing to do that. And as we just follow Him, that's all you have to do. We've talked about it. We illustrated it. David Beasley and I and John walked around here and talked about what it's like to follow Jesus Christ. And it's just a matter of focusing right on Jesus Christ, looking right at the back of His neck, staying close enough that you can see Christ at all times. And then no matter... It doesn't take a lot of thought. You don't have to sit and pre-plan, prepare. You just simply keep your eyes on Christ and He'll lead you exactly where He wants you to go. You just stay close and you just walk with Him. We stay close through the Word of God. And so as Jesus shares with them, He shares with them about the fact that He's going to go and He's going to die on the cross and He's going to be resurrected. It wasn't what they expected. And we've talked all about that, but it comes up again today. And I just want to remind you because the disciples who walked with Him for three years continued to fail in listening. That was the problem. They would see amazing things. They would watch Him do amazing miracles, but they would hear and not apply it. They would hear it, but they had their own agenda. They had their own will and their own desires. They all thought Jesus was going to come, defeat Rome, set up His kingdom, and they were going to have, on each side of Jesus Christ, they were going to be seated in these places of authority next to Jesus. That was what they had figured. That's what they had planned. And every time Jesus would say, listen, I'm about to go lay down my life, it would freak them out. And then he turns to them and he says, I'm going to lay down my life. And listen, if you're going to be one of my disciples, you're going to have to lay down your life. And you know what? It didn't stop there. It continues today. He laid down his life and he picked it back up. We lay down our life, but we don't pick it back up. We allow Jesus Christ to have our life and to keep it and to use it for his honor and his glory. There is no other way to be a Christian. When Jesus Christ said, I'm going to build my church, it is His church. Beach Grove Baptist Church is His church. Anytime you or I lay claim to it, we have wrongfully taken hold of what God is doing. That is not this building. It's not this building. Beach Grove Baptist Church is never this building. Beach Grove Baptist Church is, are, is made up of the people that are believers and are committed and sold out to Jesus Christ. That's the church. And so today when I wrap up here at about 1.30, that way if I quit a little earlier than that, John, we'll be okay, right? But anyway, when I leave here today, I'm going to head somewhere probably for a bite to eat. And then I'm going to go from there probably to home. And no matter where I am, the church of Jesus Christ is going to be right there. And you and I have to represent Christ every place He puts us. No matter where that is. That's what it means to follow Christ. To lay down your life and not take it up again. Allow Him to take you and use you for what He wants you to do. And so then in chapter 9, verse 1, He begins again by saying, Verily, now normally that word verily would mean truly. The translation of that word here means, He says unto them, verily. So what He does, it's almost like He pauses and He he emphasizes what He's going to say. He says, assuredly. In other words, He said, there is no equivocation here. Don't miss this is what He's saying. Do not ignore what I'm about to tell you. That's what Jesus Christ is saying to them. Assuredly, what I'm about to tell you is going to take place. Don't miss what I'm saying. That's what He meant. Now imagine that, to sit down in front of these men and grab them. It's like he was grabbing them by the lapels, looking them square in the eye and saying, Assuredly, what I'm about to tell you is going to happen. You need never doubt what I'm saying. This is of utmost significance, is what that absolutely means. This is of utmost 
significance. You know what? As I've listened to people teach this next little portion of Scripture, and this whole chapter in Mark chapter 9, it's almost like we just pass over it. It's almost like we just kind of lightly touch on it and we just move on. But for Jesus Christ to say this is of utmost significance means that if it was utmost significant to those men, would it not be utmost significant to us as well? We should understand it. We should know it. We should practice it. Only Jesus Christ used this phrase assuredly three times. And in Scripture, He's the only one who ever used it. He was the only one who had the authority to use it to say what I'm about to say. Pay close attention. This is what's going to take place. This is what's going to happen. And then he says this. Verse 2. After six days... Well, let me finish this. Truly, I say unto you that there will some, be some of you that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Truly, verily, assuredly, I say unto you, that there shall be some of you that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, Jesus has thoroughly explained His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Back in, in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. It could not be clearer. It was so clear that Peter became upset, as did all the disciples, and demand Jesus to retract that statement. You are not going to die. You are not going to be buried. You are not going to rise the third day. Jesus emphasized that to them. And then he steps back and he says, Assuredly, you're going to witness something that no one else has ever witnessed. You're going to see something. You're going to see the power of God demonstrated right before your eyes. And then it says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. After six days... Now, how many disciples were there? How many apostles slash disciples at this time? How many? Twelve. He takes Peter, James, and John. You know, there's a lot of people who have heartburn about that. What about the other nine? It doesn't seem fair. Why would he take those three and not take the other nine? Why is he being particular about who gets to go? Why does he choose? Why don't they all get to go? I've had a lot of people ask that question. And I can sum it up. Because he wanted to. Right? You guys need to remember something. He's God and you're not. And he can do anything he wants to do. That's the problem that we have in following God. We know a better way to do things. He often took Peter, James, and John. I read all of these commentators and all of these Bible scholars who write about this, and I've read all the different reasons why he took Peter, James, and John, and this reason and that reason. This one's going to lead this, and that one's going to lead that. Listen, I know this for a fact. He decided to take Peter, James, and John. And so that's exactly who he took. He can choose what, who he wants for what he wants any time he wants. And that's exactly what he does. He gave them a gift that he intended to use later, and so these are the people he decided to take so that they could come back and teach the others. And so he takes Peter, James, and John. He leads them unto, into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Now that word transfigured means he was changed. Now from where he was and where we've been reading about him, in Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 9, up at the very top, and I don't know if we've got it on here, right there. This is called Mount Hermon up here. You see that? And so Mount Hermon was the highest mountain in the ever in the area. In some of the other Gospels it talks about Mount Hermon and it also talks about the fact that Mount Hermon was the highest mountain in the land. And so he takes these, these men to Mount Hermon up there. It's 9,200 feet high in the air. Mount Hermon looked like 
You're about to see it. Here, there you go. You see this mountain? I don't know if you can see it in the background. This is a snow-capped mountain. That's exactly where Mount Hermon was. And it's covered with snow all up in the top, up in the area up there. Did y'all know that there was snow in Israel? This is up close to Lebanon is where this is. But this area was at the uppermost part of where Jesus was doing his ministry. And so he takes his men and they climb. You can kind of see right here. See this little road that goes up? They wound and they wound and they wound and they wound and they get over here up into this snow-capped area and they climb up into the top of that mountain. Now, it's near the area of Caesarea Philippi, which is where Jesus had already said, this is where all of these things had taken place that he's sharing with us. And it says in verse 3 of Mark chapter 9, verse 3, it says, His raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. There isn't a laundry man, there isn't a person that could have washed the clothes on Jesus Christ as white as these were. These were bleached so white, they just glistened. They were bright. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. 2 Peter 1, verse 16. Look at that real quickly. Peter writes in his letter, his epistle, that he writes what this was like on that day. 2 Peter 1 verse 16. He's sharing them. He's explaining to them that everything that he's been teaching them, everything that he has said to them, and everything that he's confirming in this letter that he's written to them, he says this, We have not followed cunningly devised fables. When we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. And this is what he's pointing to was that day that they stood there, those three, Peter, James, and John, stood and watched as Jesus Christ was transfigured. He goes on to say this, For he received, Jesus received from God the Father honor and glory that day. There came a voice to him from the excellent glory, from God himself, from the majesties on high. And that voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Can you imagine what that must have been like? To be able to go up and to be in that place. We'll look at what that was like in Mark chapter 9 in just a minute. These men, the holy men of God, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And what they did was take their pen, their quill, their, their parchments, and they sat down and God himself leaned over and said, this is what I want you to write. And they wrote it out. You know how special that book is? You get it? That book is worth dying for. That book is worth dying for. And if it's... Listen to me. I don't know what you're living for. I do not know what you're living for. But if it's not worth dying for, it's not worth living for. And there are few things worth living for. And that book is one of those things. It is the truth given to us directly by God, given to men to write down so that you and I have it. That's exactly what Peter said. I was there. I was an eyewitness. I saw it all. But he said, you know what? Let me tell you something. There's something much more important. Go back to the Scriptures. Go right back to the Scriptures. Keep going back to the Scriptures because the Scriptures will teach you everything that you need and must know. The next thing he says back in Mark chapter 9, Verse 2 is where he says that he was transfigured before them. That just means he was metamorphosed. He metaphors, meta, metamorphosed in front of them. He was changed in front of them. When we talk about metamorphosis, you know, have you ever taken or watched these little ugly caterpillars 
Some of them are stone naked. You ever seen any of them? And they are ugly. Some of them have these big horns all over them and they're just... And when you're driving down the road in the fall and you see them and you're thinking, I want a nice warm winter. So if I kill all the ones going to this side, you know, that are dark, then it's going to be warm here. Remember? And you just aim your car right at... Those little ugly caterpillar, woolly worms, willy worms, or whatever you call them, they will crawl over somewhere and they will get into this cocoon and they will then come back as this beautiful butterfly. They metamorph. They change dramatically. They're no longer anything like they were before. And so when they set to watch what was about to happen, happen they began to report back he metamorphed in front of us. What took place was was beyond what we could possibly imagine. And it happened just like that. His raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller. There wasn't a laundry man on earth that could bleach them and make them that white. This had to be supernatural. Hold your place at Mark 9, but look at Luke chapter 9. Look back at Luke chapter 9 for an account in Luke chapter 9. Look at Luke 9 verse 30. And it says in Luke 9.30, And behold, there talked with Jesus two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory. They, they appeared in this cloud of glory. And they spake. Here's what they were talking about. So Jesus, who's been trying to explain what's about to happen, just a few days, six days before, He's explained to them He's about to die. He's going to the cross. He's going to die. He's going to go to the grave. And then He's going to resurrect again. They're not buying it. And so God takes Him up to the top of the mountain. He takes these three men up with Him. The people who question mostly, is this really what's going to happen? The ones who are going to have the questions later much more than the other men. And he takes them up and they have this conversation. There's Elijah. I don't know how they knew it was Elijah, these guys. But it was Elijah. I suppose they looked up and it was a hairy man with leather underwear. And they said, there's Elijah right there. I remember reading about him in the scriptures. And then next to him was another guy kind of Bearded, they'd never seen pictures of this guy. They'd heard a lot about him, and they identified him as Moses. I, I don't know how maybe he had on a jersey that had number 10 for the commandments on the back and his name across it that said Moses. I, I, I don't know what tipped them off that this was Elijah and Moses, but they recognized this is Elijah and Mo Moses, and Jesus is standing right there in the middle of them. And they spoke. These men, the three men, spoke of Jesus' decease. They spoke about Jesus dying. They were talking about the death of Jesus Christ at Jerusalem. His death at Jerusalem. Now they're there. They're amazed by what they see. They're overwhelmed by what their eyes are taking in. But you know what? They're not hearing one thing. Here's Moses and Elijah and Jesus and their conversation. They wrote it down. Said what they were talking about was Jesus is fixing to go die in Jerusalem. Look back at Mark chapter 9. There's a word in here that is used called, I didn't read that far, but back up in, uh, I think it was, well, no, it's actually in Matthew chapter 17 too. It talks about it being glycerine. The word glycerine is mentioned. The word glycerine means it would be described as a bolt of lightning. Have you ever seen a bolt of lightning? How bright it is, and if it's very close, it's literally blinding. I remember one day, a few years ago, I was in a, one of my old Jeeps and I was traveling along on Smith Valley Road. I'll never forget this. And I just passed uh, um, Averett Road and I'm traveling along and it's a day that, boy, the you know, storm's moving in. You can see the storm moving in. And as I'm traveling there, minding my own business and the speed limit, of course, uh, as I'm <laughs> whizzing along there, all of a sudden, man, I, there's this 
flash of light. I'm not kidding you. It just, it was daytime, but it was so bright, it just would literally burn your eyes. And the ground just shook. And right next to where I was standing, there was a gas uh, lamp post out in front of somebody's house. And that lightning came down and hit that gas lamp post. And when it did, it exploded and the gas shot up out of that thing on fire and it's burning and just going and glowing. And I thought, I mean, I felt it from the pedals up into my body when that thing hit and it exploded. I mean, it was amazing. And I thought, whoa, man, that's awesome. And there was a big pine tree right next to it. And that gas hit that pine tree and it just exploded. I mean, it was enough to make me slow down for a couple minutes and take a look at that. I mean, that was absolutely overwhelming, amazing. And I thought to myself, wow, that's what it must have been like watching Jesus get transfigured. Take your breath away. Like a bolt of lightning, that brightness, that brilliance. And they stood and they looked at it till they got into their pockets, got their sunglasses out, and just put them on and thought, this is overwhelming. This is amazing. This is unbelievable. No one could do that. There appeared unto them, in chapter 9, verse 4, there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now Elias always rep represented in the Scriptures. The prophets. He's always talked about as one of the prophets and the prophets in Scripture. That meant the preachers and the Word of God that was delivered to the people, the nation of Israel, and the people even today. It just word means those who have preached. And so Elijah was known as the preacher, and that was where the Word came from. And so Elijah, Elijah is there, and he's representing the Word of God and what was preached. And then Moses was always a picture of the law. And so here's the preaching, and here's the law, and here's Jesus Christ between the two bringing it all together. He united the law and the preaching. He was the exclamation point of all of that. As he stood there and he pulled everything together as a picture and a demonstration of what Jesus Christ has come to do and he's about to do to all of Israel and as he's about to start his church. This is the picture, the understanding of the word, the understanding of the law and how it all fits together. And Peter answered and he said to Jesus, Master, teacher, honorable teacher, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Because he didn't know what else to say. They were sore afraid. They were scared to death. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do. There's a scripture in the book of Proverbs that says, let me think how it goes exactly. It's better to let think people think that you're a fool than to open your mouth and let them prove it. Okay? So, at some times, you should just be quiet. Peter was often to speak up and say the wrong thing. And so for him to say, we need to build a booth. They would do the, when they would worship God, they would build these booths and places where they would worship. And the booths were little tabernacles. And these tabernacles would be places that they would build to honor someone. And so when he turns and he says to Jesus, man, this is awesome. This is, well, look at there. There's Elias and there's Moses and there's you, Jesus. We need to be three, build three tabernacles to honor you three. You never honored those three. If you had tried to build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah, they would have worked you over. There was only one worthy of a tabernacle. And that was the one that stood in the middle, and that was Jesus Christ. But Peter didn't understand. And sometimes we don't understand. And so when we don't understand, it's best to hold our tongue. It said there was a cloud that came and overshadowed them. Verse 7. There was a voice that came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. The word beloved, Son, that Jesus, that was spoken from the cloud. And of course this cloud was the Shekinah glory of God that appeared and enveloped these men and enveloped all of these men, the three that had come up with Christ. 
So the six of them stood there in the glory and the cloud, the Shekinah glory of God. And what he said, this is my beloved son, was the second time he had said that, even in the book of Mark. Mark, 11, Mark, Mark verse 1, verse 11, chapter 1, verse 11, states that when he was, Jesus was baptized, a voice came from the heaven and it said exactly the same thing. In other words, it was emphasizing, please do not forget, this is my son. This is God himself. He's not to be compared with Elijah. He's not to be compared with Moses. He stands alone. He is God himself in the flesh in your presence. You know what I often think about? In that situation, and all through this book, it says this. I, 40 years or so ago now, came to the understanding of who God was. I've learned, I'm learning still so much about God every week. It's just amazing what God teaches me about Himself. But when I began to understand who God was, and I understood this, when I asked Christ to forgive me of my sins, And I understood. I told you last week. I knew what that meant. That meant my life would forever change. I would no longer be able to continue to live the way I was going. I had been living. My life would radically change as a result of my giving my life to God. And here's how I knew that. Every time it says in Scripture, it begins to describe who God is. It begins to describe who Jesus Christ is. It also says this, that when I asked for forgiveness, He moved into my life. He came into my heart, and He dwells there. So you answer one question for me. Please, answer this question. How can you be a Christian and not be radically different? If that's what God is like, how can I be the same way I always was. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. When I go, Jesus said this, Mark chapter 5. He said, hey Ron, everywhere you go, you are salt and you are light. Why is that? Because Jesus Christ moved inside of me. And His glory and His might and His power lives inside of me. And if He doesn't do that for you, you are none of His. Those are His words, not mine. People will stand there on the day of judgment, claim to be Christians. He will turn to the Father and say, they're none of mine. I don't know them. How can we be the church and not be the church? You can't. You either are or you aren't. It's that clear. It's that bold. It's that plain. There was a cloud that overshadowed them. A voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son. And then He said this, Hear Him. This is my beloved Son. Hear Him. How do you go home, throw that on a bookcase, and ignore it the rest of the week? When God Himself said, Listen to what He has to say. Listen to what He has to say. I'd just like to know, Who else, what radio station do you listen to that does that there is none it only comes from here isn't that what Peter just said a minute ago do you know why Christianity is so messed up today it's because we have all these goofy crazy ideas coming from all different directions and we've given every one of them credibility and ignored this a little bit of advice Shut your radio off for a little while and open up this. Put away your 
phone and open up this. Open up this. Put away your cell phone with your Bible on it. I've told you. I don't know what I did with my cell phone. It's laying over there. I got about 17 Bibles on that phone. That's honest and true. But when I want to study the Bible, I never pick up that phone. Because while I'm studying the Bible on that phone, Adam Fleener will text me and say, Hey, I got a question for you, man. And I want to answer his question. I see it bang. You know, it comes right up. It goes right in front of the Scripture that I'm reading. It, I can be reading and deeply involved in Scripture, and all of a sudden, my daughter says, Hey, Dad, look at the picture I just took. <laughs> and if I don't stop what I'm doing and text her back and say, That's awesome. She's upset with me. Well, why didn't you text me back? Is that right? Where's Amanda? Amanda, is that right? Huh? Right? No, it isn't right. Yeah, it is too. Now you need to come forward for lying. So there you go. <laughs> but you see, if my phone is there and I'm here and the Scripture's open, I don't get interrupted. You need a Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. And we'll show you how to use it. We do that several times a week here. We teach you how to use the Bible. You need to go to the book. You need to get into the Bible. You need to be undisturbed. Because God said, not me, God said, hear what He's saying. You know why I'm emphasizing that? In just a few moments after He has said that, they haven't heard one thing that happened up on that mountain. They were overwhelmed by what they saw and they ignored what they heard. And you know what? Today, you will get in your car and you'll think sometimes about that crazy preacher and what he did on the pulpit, but you'll not think about one thing that he said. Because if you think about what he said, it might just change your life. Because all we've done is read you the Bible. <coughs> suddenly, suddenly, verse 8. Suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore except Jesus Christ with themselves. The focus now returns to Jesus alone. Just as it must in our lives day in and day out. If Jesus Christ is not your focus, you will fall into idolatry, I guarantee it. If your focus isn't on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, when He's talking about in Hebrews chapter 11, He's talking about our, the heroes of our faith. And it lists Abraham and Noah and it goes through all of these people who have done amazing things for God just because they trusted God and they believed God and they put their hope and their faith in God. And then he says, listen, if this race that you're running, there are people on both sides of the track cheering you on. There are these witnesses that are calling to you saying, keep it up, don't quit, keep going, don't quit. I know that this morning, right now, in heaven, my mom and my dad and my brother Terry and a lot of my old friends are in heaven today that are cheering me on saying, stay with it, don't quit. Not just in that pulpit, but on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Keep running the race. Don't give up. This race is a long one. It's a difficult one. You'll trip and you'll fall just like when you made, they made their way to the top of that mountain. It was narrow and it was treacherous and it was difficult, but they stayed right behind Jesus to the top of the mountain. Don't quit. You know, I prayed this morning for every one of my grandkids. I prayed this morning for every one of my children by name. God, don't let them quit. If the whole world quits, God, let them get in the fight and fight to their death. Don't let them ever quit. No matter how tough the road gets, God, let them to be committed to You no matter what. God, if the world comes against them and it's them against the entire world, God, don't let my children become children that will not stand for Jesus Christ. Never let that happen. God, please, please honor me that. I don't care what you do to me. It doesn't matter. But God, I'm just trusting and praying that my family will live for you. They will serve you to their last breath.
And they will share Christ with everyone and with the whole world. If they are the Noahs of this generation who will build that ark and no one will get on it but them, Lord, don't let one of those children perish. Fight the fight. Stand in the battle. Never give up. Keep, and Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, there's only one way to do that. He says, look toward the finish line. Keep your eyes on the finish line. Because when you look at the finish line, you're going to see something. He said, every time, you're going to see me standing there. Holds through my hands. Saying, come on, boy. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't walk. Run this race with persistence. With patience. Never quit. Never die. Never give up. Never give in. You run and you run and you run. Let me ask you. Are you running the race? If I were to come to your children today and set them down, look them in the eye and say, Listen, tell me, how's mom and dad doing in running the race? Tell me how they're doing. Listen, you don't need me to do that. God Almighty is looking down at you, mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, and He's the one that's determining the race that you're running. It doesn't matter what I see. It matters what He sees. And when everything else was removed, when all the glory and the Shekinah of glory of God had lifted, when Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets are all gone, the only thing left, the only thing left in front of them was Jesus Christ. And here's a word to the wise. That's all that's going to be in front of you someday. You're going to be standing there all alone in the presence of Christ. He's going to look straight into your heart. And He's going to look right down into your eyes and right down in. You know what it says? It says that the Jesus Christ, His eyes are like a laser. Just like a laser. It's just this little, I don't know why my laser's not working. But anyway, there you go. You're going to look into the eyes of God. It says they're a fiery, burning laser. And you're going to look into those eyes. You're going to stare into them. You can't look away. You're captured by the eyes. And those eyes are going to burn their way into your eyes and down into your heart. And Jesus is going to take a good look around, which He's already done. And you're going to say, He's going to say, let's talk about your life. You won't tell Him any lie. You won't make any excuse because he knows the truth. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he's a two-edged sword. He divides the marrow and the bones. In other words, he cuts right down to the very, very close edge. And he cuts right down to the thoughts in your mind and the intents of your heart. You see, he looked down here this morning and he said, Ron, let's see how you, why you're preaching today. Is it because they pay you? Is it because you want to put on a show? Why is it you're preaching? Is it because you love those people? That you'd give your life for those people? That there's nothing more important than understanding and knowing Jesus Christ? What's your motive? He will look at you and judge the thoughts and intents of your heart. There won't be any fooling. And so today, when it's just you and Jesus, and you're standing there after all the cloud is gone, and everything clears, and it's just you and Jesus, what's it going to be like? Because it's coming to that. And you know what I believe? It's coming soon. Real soon. I wouldn't put it off. I'd be knowing I'd be knowing as quickly as I could. Father, sometimes knowing that you know the thoughts and intents of my heart causes me to shudder. Standing in your presence, knowing that I am in, inside of the very presence of God, knowing that what was written in Psalm 139 is absolutely true. There is no way to escape you. If I went to the bottom of the ocean floor, I'd find you there. 
If I went to the bottom of hell, I would find you there. God, you see everything. You know everything. If I go to the furthest star, we don't even know where that is. But I know that when I get there, you'll be there. God, you are inescapable. Your brightness and your glory. Human eyes can't even look at it. When Moses came down off the mountain after being with you 40 days, Scripture says that his face was glistering. It shone. It was so bright that they had to put a veil over the face of Moses just to sit in his presence because he'd been in the presence of God. It radically changed even his presence, his being. How is it we can claim we are Christians and not be changed? That's absurdity. How can we still be drawn to the same old sins and participate in them without conviction? It's absurdity. Lord God, I pray that we'll play, pray that we'll pay very close attention to your word. We'll hear it and then we'll heed it. We'll live it with all of our heart. Lord, change us because we need to be changed. As good as we think we are, we radically need change. And God, I pray that you'll do exactly that. Lord, teach us to walk with you. Teach us to study your word. You give us that understanding. Just as you did your men when you went to be with the Father after your death and resurrection. You gave them an understanding. And the scriptures teach us if we're Christians, we have been given an understanding to understand the word of God so that we can apply it. And God, I pray that we would endeavor and to study your word and to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.